All right, people, who's excited? Who's fired up? Who should probably stick to their day job? Welcome to Pulse 2018, or as we're calling it at Gainsight, Success Fest 2018. As you can see from this amazing audience, this is clearly the largest customer success event in history. More than 5,000 people here. But I've got some other news for you. It's the largest customer success slash rap event in history as well. And we got news from the future. It's the last customer success slash rap event in history. Really excited to have you all here, especially for our sixth annual Pulse. So this is happy, happy anniversary Pulse. Very excited. Sixth time we're having this conference here. And as most of you know, the traditional uh, anniversary gift for the sixth anniversary is a giant Ferris wheel. So we took care of Pulse this year. This year, Pulse's theme is all about music. It's a music festival. Now, why do we do that at Gainsight? For three reasons. Number one, we love music, despite the fact that we have no talent whatsoever, as you can see. Number two, I think Pulse itself is like a giant festival. All of us coming together, learning from each other, celebrating each other. But the third reason, I think the biggest reason, is we're all learning in the customer success community that customer success is not just a solo act. It's not about one person being on stage. It's about all of us. It's not just the CSM team. All of us coming together to kind of make music for our clients and, and drive success for everyone together. So I think music is a great theme for what we're going to talk about today. Now, I will say, I'm not going to lie, we were pretty proud of the success of that song that's available on Spotify. Little known fact, there's actually a billboard list for tech CEO songs. And it, this is actually number one right now. And I, I'm, I'm not going to like throw any shade, but I know Satya Nadella is doing a great job, a great job at Microsoft driving that cloud revenue. But he better work on his record revenue, because it's really dropping, as you can see there. Uh, but now, now, fun fact, to get to number one on this chart, you need three, so three song downloads on Spotify. So, and those are all my mom, by the way. So, uh, but we, we also love music because it lets us take a, a walk through history. And if you like hip hop like I do, some of the hip hop lyrics really resonate with what we're going through in the Pulse community. This is our, our uh, uh, friend, may rest in peace, Biggie, who talked about the fact that it was all a dream. And if you were here at Pulse 2013, it, that seemed like a dream to where we are now. It's crazy. It was a tiny little room, 300 people, all of us trying to figure out why we were there in the first place. And now if we fast forward six years later, we look around and we ain't no scrubs in the customer success community. Seriously, we're legit. This is a real thing and you can see it here in the audience. We're not hanging out of the uh, passenger side of our best friend's ride trying to holler. By the way, best friend's ride means the salesperson's ride. So we, are, we got our own ride now. And it's really, really exciting that the Pulse community has come so far. So to talk about the Pulse community and kind of who's here today, I want to wel welcome my colleague, Lauren Olerich, to the stage, who's our head of Amer EMEA Marketing. Welcome, Lauren. Awesome. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Nick. You excited? I'm fired up. Awesome. I think that's what I'm supposed to say. That's, that's, a, that's the pro line. I get, yeah. I get a little royalty every time somebody says that, by the way. Good. So it's awesome. <laughs> Great. So tell us a little bit about the Pulse community, Lauren. So many of you have been coming back over the years, the past six years, to connect with your peers, to learn from experts, and to collect those uh, pulse pins that you put on your lanyards. I'm really excited to be here and to see the industry go, grow over time. That's amazing. And one of the things we like to do at the beginning of Pulse is recognize how much the movement has grown visually, and also recognize the people that were there at the beginning. So if you were at Pulse 23 in a, 2013 in a tiny little room in San Francisco, saw me wear a football helmet and do a Heisman on stage for some unknown reason, stand up and be recognized amongst your peers if you were at Pulse 2013. <laughs> Round of applause for those Pulse pioneers. That's amazing, amazing how much this has grown. Awesome. Stay standing, by the way. Stay standing. We're going to do the whole, whole group together. All right, stand if you were there at Pulse 2014 and you saw Nick on stage with a giant fish. It looks weird now, but trust me, it kind of made sense at the time. Stand up here at Pulse stand 2014. Up. Let's see if there, who else joined. Awesome. <laughs> and stand up if you were at Pulse 2015, where we actually, uh, for some reason, had the Burger King guy on stage, had a Taylor Swift impersonator, and had a t-shirt cannon that I shot out. See there? Awesome. Welcome. Thank you. 
And if you were at Pulse 2016, our first year in Oakland, please stand up. You probably saw the Disney-inspired musical on stage. Great. And if you were at one of my proudest moments, Pulse 2017, where one of our customers, who's probably here in the audience, um, uh, made a bet with me, and I lost the bet, and I had to wear a Tom Brady jersey on stage. I'm not a, I'm a Steeler fan, so that really <laughs> hurt. And I won up to him by getting it slimed at the end of the conference. Stand up if you're at Pulse 2017. We have a lot of people here at Pulse 2017. Awesome. All right, now stand up if you were at Pulse 2018. That's all Let's of you. Let's see it. Let's see who's at Pulse 2018. Stand up, everyone. Awesome. Great. Well, have a seat. Thank you so much. And as you can see from the audience, the community has grown so much. Last year, if you're in Oakland, one of the unfortunate things was it was pretty tight with 4,000 people there. So we're really excited to bring the conference to the next level here in San Mateo. Big thanks to the folks at San Mateo that let our community grow. And a lot of you actually traveled further from the peninsula. Uh, we have 43 states in the audience today, which is amazing. And some of you even made the really long commute all the way from the East Bay. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> you know, it's a little rough. Awesome. And amazing, just folks from all around the world. You can see 54 countries represented here. And frankly, one of our missions now is to start bringing Pulse to other places. You'll hear more about that in a little bit. It's important for us also to make sure that Pulse is a event for companies of all sizes. So as you can see, Pulse is not just a startup event, nor is it a big company event. It's an all company event. That's right. Now, with all these people here, one of the big challenges is how do you connect with people really well? And so one of the things we tried to do this year to take it to the next level is we created a networking app, um, a, a, some technology we wrote that lets you fill out a survey. And, uh, and about 1,000 of you did this that basically told, asked you, what's your CSM strategy, your touch model, your company size? And we match you with people to meet with. And so excited that many of you got matched this way. We're going to be doing a lot more of this going forward so you can get to the right people to have the right conversations. And we want to take a moment to recognize some of the logos that are behind me. Uh, these are all companies that decided to send over 15 people to Pulse today, and they're treating Pulse as their annual Pulse, uh, sorry, customer success offsite. Um, so thank you to those companies. Awesome. Round of applause for the teams. Great stuff. Now, obviously, a lot of us are here at Pulse, not just for the music, not just for the fun, but actually to, to hear from great speakers. We're so fortunate at Pulse every year, and this year especially, to have some amazing speakers, both in the breakouts, which we'll talk about later, as well as the keynotes. These are the keynote speakers here. All very accomplished, energetic, uh, inspiring. But one thing that's amazing for me is the customer success community has so much diversity in it. If you look at the keynote speakers there, you'll see people from all walks of life, you know, men and women, lots of leaders from all over. And all of us know that we want to do a better job elevating the conversation of diversity at the senior levels in companies. And we want to do a better job bringing diversity all the way to the board level. So one of the things I'm excited about is although I think we still have a way to go even in customer success and diversity, I think we can lead the charge for companies in general to bring a more diverse conversation to the boardroom. So with that, I want to introduce Coco Brown, CEO of Athena Alliance. And we're excited to announce a partnership with Athena. Welcome, Coco. Please come up on stage. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. How you doing, Coco? I'm all fired up. Awesome. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here with such an inspiring, progressive industry. Thank you. Do I, uh, am I in the right direction? Yeah, just click once the exit. The, yeah. Aha. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are talking about diversity as well they should and, and gender diversity. And we talk about it from the perspective of fairness. We talk about it from the per perspective of mimicking the demographics of our society as a whole. Those are the obvious reasons, the ones that my kids would look at me and say, yeah, mom, that makes sense. Um, but what I want to talk about is diversity from the perspective of the economic imperative of diversity, the business imperative of diversity, and really the modern business imperative of diversity. So, oh, uh, where are our slides? I'm sorry. They're right down I'm there. So you can see them there. Sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Pardon me for uh, being backwards here. Um, let me just, I think I clicked through our slides just a little too quickly because I wasn't aware of where we were. People, I'm with you now. Are you with awesome. me? <laughs> okay, are you with me? All yeah. right, good. Here we go. 
so here, here's the economic imperative. The economic imperative is women are now 45% of the breadwinners, right? It's the, the time, yeah. <laughs> The time when we were really very divided in the roles that we played in family are over, and we really are counted on by our families to provide, right? We're also 75% of the decision makers in purchasing, and we're 48.6% of the U.S. labor force. Beyond this, from a business imperative perspective, when you have diversity at the top ranks of leadership, and this is just in the boardroom, but when you have diversity at the top ranks of leadership, you have better performance of your businesses. Your businesses live longer, they make more money, they get better returns on sales and equity. They're just overall better businesses. And the problem is, is that we cannot actively affect that, that uh, benefit, the, the, diverse, the dividend of diversity without actually creating some real effort around that. And the problem here that we're trying to address is the fact that only, we're at a, such a low starting point that it's a practical zero. When you look at women in the C-suite, we're less than 20%. When you look at women in the boardroom, we're maybe 20% if you look at the biggest companies. But when you look at the companies under a billion dollar market cap, it's 11%. And when you look at the private companies, it's even less than 10%. And everybody risks and everybody loses when, when that's the case. Um, but those are the impairments right, that the opportunity that we have together is that if you start to change from the top, you will create systemic change throughout. And when I look at the modern boardroom and I think about the modern company, everything has changed. Think about 5,000 people in this room defining an industry right now, customer success, right? Everything has changed, whether it's customer success or chief revenue officer or chief digital officer, right? So much about how we engage with employee, with customer, with community is different today than it was just even 10 years ago. And modern companies, companies like Gainsight, get that, right? And so Nick and Allison and the team here are saying, you know what? Not only are we leading an entire industry, but we want to lead it from the top. We want to make sure that women have a role to play and that actually the boards are designed to lead to steward companies into the future, not just provide a governance structure with a traditional CEO and CFO role or CFO role. So what that means is you have room being made for CIOs, for CMOs, for chief product officers, and it's time to make room for chief customer officers as well. Our mission to accelerate gender diversity in the boardroom, but we're doing it by building the modern boardroom. And we have an announcement to make. Very exciting. Yes, yeah. I'm really excited about it. I think it's one of the most progressive things I've seen. Um, there are so many companies out there creating parity pledges and diversity pledges and Rooney rules and, you know, but it's hard to take action and action requires commitment. And Gainsight is doing a number of things that are committed. One is that for you people here today, we have a booth, uh, an Athena Alliance booth. I encourage you to come talk to me, to talk to our COO, Dana, who's here. We will tell you about the Athena Alliance programs. One of them is the Inspiring Director program, which we very much want you to engage in. Sorry, people. My mic's messing with me now. <laughs> um, we very much want you to engage in. If you are a leader in customer success, we will help you walk the last mile to get to the boardroom. And that is a lot to do with who knows you, who you know, how visible you are, and whether or not you have the right branding and story around who you are. Now, Gainsight is going to put the money behind that. They have agreed to sponsor five women to join the Athena Alliance from this audience here. So come see us. We need to know who you are in order to do that. Um, and you need to take our assessment so we can figure this out together, right? Um, the next thing, I'm gonna, and then I'm going to hand it back to, to Nick. The last thing is, is that Alice and I are going to work together on a collaborative piece about why the customer success individual needs to be in the boardroom, man or woman. And we will promote that to help drive the industry to the top. Awesome. Thank you so much, Coco. I don't need the mic, but I got that. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Coco. Awesome. Good. So back to Lauren. Oh, you okay? 
Mic drop. It's uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice try to say. Yeah, so um, in the spirit of expanding opportunity, I want to take a moment to celebrate the 500 graduates of Custom, or excuse me, Pulse Academy Live that happened yesterday. So a quick round of applause for you guys. Woo! And something very exciting, as part of the Gainsight Gives initiative, we decided to actually open the doors to Pulse Academy and sponsor the tuition for a few groups of people. Veterans, parents who've spent an extended time at home with their children, or people who are in need of an exciting jumpstart to their customer success career. So they were able to join us yesterday as well. Awesome. And I want to take a moment to thank our amazing sponsors of Pulse. Uh, first of all, without companies like our Titanium sponsors, N3 and Service Rocket, none of this would be possible. Also, we worked with our Platinum sponsors, uh, Digital, or sorry, Deloitte Digital, Accenture, Slack, uh, Coastal Cloud, and Service Source. I have to look, do a little cheat sheet there. Um, without them, uh, it, we wouldn't be able to pull an event like this off and this scale. And I also want to uh, do a shout out to our gold sponsors, TSIA, Higher Logic, Pendo, User IQ, and Eigenworks. Thank you to them. You can all go and find out more about our sponsors in the hub, which is just next door. Great. Awesome. All right, so I want to share um, some really exciting announcements that fall under the Pulse brand. And as you may notice, we have an exciting new look in store for uh, the next chapter of the Pulse brand. So it's, it's very nice. You're going to see it all over for the next several years. Um, we think of Pulse in three core areas, uh, deeper education, local access, and global reach. First of all, uh, I mentioned Pulse Academy just a bit ago. It is our foundational training uh, program. We are going to be doubling down a lot on Pulse Academy. We already have a lot of great tracks to it, but we're going to incorporate some elements into a digital uh, piece of Pulse Academy. And we're going to bring Pulse Academy uh, alongside other key events that we're going to be hosting, like our road shows. And we're also working with local uh, universities and professors to develop a college curriculum that falls into customer success. So that way, people can actually learn more about it and then graduate and be able to enter right away into a customer success role. That's very exciting, because I know there's so much demand for yeah. CS talent, so very exciting. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Pulse Local, it's our n uh, local networking program that we have. Uh, we, are have we have 50 active Pulse Local chapters across the world from New York to Tokyo, and they're groups that meet on a quarterly basis to share best practices. Uh, we have a really, really exciting partnership that we're announcing today, actually, uh, that combines Pulse Local with our friends at WeWork. As I'm sure you all know, WeWork is a huge co-working space um, company. They have locations in 240 different physical spaces across 72 cities in 21 countries, and they have over 230,000 global members. So if you think about that for a moment, and you think about the scale that we can now reach with Pulse Local, it's just incredible. So anywhere where there's a WeWork location, they are now supporting Co uh, po Pulse Local groups to meet in their offices uh, right away. So it's, it's really cool. Awesome. Thanks to WeWork on that. Great. So now, uh, is anyone here from Europe? Woo! I, kn I know I've been calling London, London home for the past eight months, and we've been seeing some amazing traction all over Europe. Uh, we are here to announce today our fourth annual Pulse Europe conference, which will be taking place again in London in November. Last year, we saw 1,100 attendees, and we're hoping to get over 1,500 this year. So uh, send a Slack note to your European team members and let them know that they can sign up now for that event. And uh, you know, it's not just about the US and Europe anymore when we think about the global reach of Pulse. We are now going to be introducing Pulse APAC, a third conference uh, in the Pulse portfolio. It's really exciting. It'll be uh, going to Sydney, Australia in December. Um, so again, you know, use your Slack messages and tell your teams in the Asia Pacific region that this event is now live and they can sign up. Awesome. Who wants to go to Sydney? It should be fun. Awesome. Very exciting.
Yeah, so as you can see, we're very serious about fanning the flames of uh, the customer success movement with all of these Pulse programs, and we're really excited to be uh, sharing the growth of the Pulse, or, yeah, the Pulse community and the customer success community with you all. Thank you. We're also really excited about making sure that every year we try to learn from your feedback at Pulse. So, you know, just like all of you, we're super religious about surveys and feedback, and we'll ask you tons of questions about what you thought, and we measure net promoter score at Pulse every year, and generally it's been pretty good, but every year we want to learn from how we can make it better and a better experience for you. Yeah, and just as an example, last year we heard feedback that you love the childlike joy elements, so we're incorporating those in this music festival theme. Obviously, there's that Ferris wheel outside that's very fun and childlike joy. Uh, but we also heard from you that the halls were too crowded last year and the room's capacity was a problem. Uh, so as you can see, we supersized the venue. We're over like multiple acres now, um, so hopefully you're wearing comfy shoes. And we also did uh, some session registration, so that way we were able to be a little bit more predictable with room capacity. But one of the biggest things we heard from you as, as Pulse has grown is that you come here all, not just for the connections or the fun, but also the content. And you know, content is really important. Also, with a big audience, it's pretty challenging. And we've all been to events where the, con the, the event might be fun, but the content's not that great. So this year, my number one focus was making the content amazing. And so actually, I started a discussion with many of you months ago on LinkedIn about what it looks like to have an amazing content experience in a conference. You talked about how panels can be really boring, how people talk about their companies too much, how stuff is too high level and not detail oriented. And this year we aim to really change all that. First of all, we really simplified the conference, fewer tracks so we can have fewer speakers and higher quality. But on top of that, we all know that everyone can be a great speaker with the right training. So we partnered with Sue Heilbrunner, who's actually the leading TEDx speaker trainer for TEDx Boulder, one of the biggest TEDx's out there, and she's amazing. And she did speaker training for all of the breakout speakers that you're going to see at the conference. And I think all of them have benefited from her training. But, but I took this personally. This is really important for me to have a great experience at this conference for all of you. And so I, some of you know this. I took the last two weeks of my calendar, the, not last week, but the two before, almost the entire time, a couple little exceptions as you see there, but almost the entire time doing rehearsals with every single breakout session. So 60 breakout sessions, 60 video conference calls. By the way, that's not healthy uh, by any means. Don't do that. But it was amazing. It was amazing to see all the content that's here. And you're going to see really actionable content, a lot of fun, and stuff I think you can definitely take away. So I'm looking forward to your experience with the content this year. On that note, you know, I think one of the big challenges at a big conference like this is where do you go? There's so much content. Even though we have fewer tracks, there's still a lot of content. So I want to spend a couple minutes talking about what you're going to see the next two days and where you should focus. So we have seven tracks at the conference, and we've been very thoughtful about these. We actually asked you on LinkedIn, what are the themes you want to see covered? And these are the ones that were the most popular. Number one, we know a lot of your individual contributor CSMs or account managers or salespeople, you want to be better at your craft. And we have a track for you called career success. We're going to hear really practical things, like how do you manage your calendar better? How do you do EBRs? Things like that. And by the way, that's also very valuable if you're a manager and want to help your team get better. Number two, we're, we have a track for executives who want to elevate the conversation. Because CSM isn't all of CS. There's a lot more to customer success than CSM. So if you want to talk about the connection to services or marketing or sales, go to the executive symposium. Number three, some of you are experts and want to go really deep, right? You don't just want the high level. One way to go deep is to learn about how one company does customer success end to end. And that's Success Showcase. We've chosen eight companies to present, each one of them presenting on everything they do, from org chart to strategy to process to metrics to like systems and technology end to end. We go really deep. And these are eight of the most sophisticated companies out there. Number four, you know, we'll talk more about this in a bit, but we want to do a better job at Gainsight of trying to share what we think of as the best practice out there. So if you want to learn our best practice in conjunction with some customers who are presenting, come to the Science of Customer Success track. This one and the Success Showcase are going to be some of the most detail-oriented tracks out there. Science of Customer Success will go through our best practice recommendations on renewals and advocacy in other areas. Number five, if you're the kind of person who doesn't want to just sit there and listen, but you want to actually lean in and participate, 
go to our workshop. Our workshops are round tables where you can sit with other people, meet peers, and talk about things like net promoter score and customer journeys. Number six, if you want to hear from some of our amazing sponsors about their best practices, go to the case study theater, which is right in the expo hall. And number seven, finally, if you're somebody who's taken over a new role or just got bought by a private equity firm or is trying to drive change in your company, we have a whole track all about change management. It's going to be really, really powerful. Now, final thing, the G's up there indicate tracks when there's going to be more detailed Gainsight technology content. Some of you want to hear about Gainsight technology, go to those tracks. Some of you don't, don't go to those tracks. We want to make it really clear for you. So we have a lot to cover in two days. Those tracks look amazing. Um, and we also tried to make the lunches as productive as well. So I want to call out a few things. There are lunch and learns on both days. There's also a women in leadership forum that's happening today. So given what Coco and Nick talked about, I think that would be a great thing to check out. And then if you're a Gainsight customer, we have something called Circles of Success. And that is where you can connect with other Gainsight customers uh, to talk about Gainsight product. Great. Now, and if that content isn't enough to get you excited, uh, we also always do some really fun giveaways at Pulse. This year, today, at the end of the closing keynote, we're going to be giving away a VIP experience at Bottle Rock, which is an amazing music festival happening in Napa uh, in May. And even though the singing on stage this morning was great, uh, <laughs> Bottle Rock has Snoop Dogg, Bruno Mars, uh, Muse, some other fantastic acts. Awesome. And then tomorrow, if you want to take the whole music thing and, and test it yourself, uh, we're going to be giving away, giving away an autographed uh, guitar by the late, great Tom Petty. So We all love Tom Petty. Stick around. Rest in peace. Okay, let's talk about tonight. It is going to be absolutely epic. We have the Success Fest conference, or sorry, Success Fest party happening out uh, on the Grove, the lawn, tonight at 5.30. We have food trucks. Uh, we've got an art car installation. We have an amazing 80s cover band called Tainted Love. It's going to be really fun, uh, so check that out. Awesome. Now, we have some final logistics to cover, so uh, I want to just quickly go through all of these. Make sure you have the Pulse 2018 app downloaded. If you want to tweet, use the hashtag Pulse2018. In your attendee success guide, if you're a full conference pass holder, you're going to have some meal tickets. Please do not lose those. Um, they're your ticket to the awesome food trucks. Also, every slide uh, that you'll see today at Pulse is available at this bit.ly link um, on the screens. And then if you have questions, look for those bright blue staff t-shirts and we can find someone to answer your question. And then coffee, 100% all the time in the hub, which is the building next door with all of the sponsors. If you need anything, we have a Pulse helpline. Uh, the number is there and it will be rotating on all of the house slides. And you can also tweet us at hashtag Pulse help. Now, we want to make Pulse interactive, right, Lauren? Like, that's a big goal this year. Oh, yeah. Big interactive uh, element to Pulse. So I wanted to test that out right now, if that's OK. Yeah, that sounds fun. fun cool. Mind. So everyone, pull out your phones. And you can either go to slido.com, or you can find the Slido tab on the Pulse 2018 app. And we're going to do a little bit of a poll. Um, so I would love it if you could drop your answer like it's hot into the app. What's the, what's the question <laughs> we're asking? Uh, the question is, who is your favorite rapper of all time? We just have the greats uh, selected. I'm right here, though, so I don't know. Let's, let's see how this goes. Let's see how many people vote. You're doing pretty well. I'm tied with B.I.G. That's pretty amazing. Let's uh, see. Oh. I actually oh. kind of oh. hope I lose this one, just for <laughs> the sake of the other artists. So you guys are getting a sense of how this works, and we're going to have this throughout the conference to actually let you interact with the, the presenters. We're going to do Q&A through this. We're going to do Q&A later with me through this. So should be great. Yep. I have no idea. Why. I think the system's actually not working. Slido, you guys have a bug. It's, that <laughs> ranking is clearly wrong. So thank you. Don't doubt uh, yourself. Awesome. <laughs> well, the last thing I think as a Pulse community, I'm sorry, actually go back one slide. Um, you can go back to the previous slide, please. Um, so the last thing we always like to do, Lauren, at the Pulse event every year is do that annual tradition we do to show our fellow pulsers how much we mean to each other, how we're going to support each other. Yep. So let's find our fellow pulsers and let's bring up the fist bump slide and let's do the pulse fist bump and show everyone and your neighbor you're going to support them this year. So fist bump your neighbor, everyone. We'll show them that you're going to be supporting them this year at Pulse. And thank you so much, Lauren. Really appreciate it.
uh, uh, have a great rest of Pulse. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Thank you. And to keep things going and get a little deeper, let's talk about where customer success is going and what some of the most innovative amongst you are doing customer success. Let me welcome my colleague, Allison Pickens, Chief Customer Officer of Gainsight. Allison. Yeah, you dance much better than I do. Yeah. Awesome. How you doing, Allison? I think I'm great. I got my tassels. I'm ready for me. Oh, um, that is awesome. I, I need tassels next time, too. I like that. Well done. Awesome, <laughs> awesome, Allison. So every year at Pulse, we share what we're hearing from you about what the leading customer success organizations are doing. And over time, many of these trends become mainstream. For example, building a customer success operations team or building a customer marketing initiative. So this year, we're excited to unveil the latest trends that we're hearing from the Pulse community. Amazing. Okay, so trend number one is actually one I think is really relevant for the rest of this morning is I believe customer success is truly crossing the chasm. Now, we have Jeff Moore right here on stage right after us, so we'll ask him if it is too. He wrote the book on crossing the chasm. But the reason I be believe it's crossing the chasm is we've gone in a lot of companies from is customer success a thing, does it matter, to actually how do we do it? And we've gone from it's a little project to something that's going much more mainstream. Not all of you have done that, but a lot of companies out there are doing that. And one of the things we figured out at Gainsight is as things go mainstream, you've got to simplify them. You've got to be able to explain it. Because customer success, to a lot of people, it's hard to understand what it is. A lot of people think customer success, oh, that's customer support, that's customer sat. So at Gainsight, for a very simple, mainstream way to describe customer success, we talk about the fact that customer success is this combination of getting your customers to their desired outcome, CO, with great experiences, CX. And this very simple formula has started to resonate with people as a very easy way to explain what we all do to other people as we cross the chasm. Now, crossing the chasm happens as an industry, but it also happens in our companies, right? All of us are going through this maturity process. I was talking to somebody about this last night, how it's, you know, you'd like customer success to be this up into the right thing in your company, but it never is, right? It's like that chart that says what success looks like, it's like up into the right, but what it really looks like is kind of up and down. And many of you have been through that roller coaster of customer success in your company. I'd love to see if this resonates with you. Many of you have had somebody in your company senior a few years ago get inspired by customer success. Maybe your CEO, maybe they read some book on customer success or something, right? And they got excited and they said, we're gonna do customer success in our company. You've, you've met people like that, right? They were really excited. And then they hire one of you in the audience as a customer success executive. By the way, you're gonna just change everything in this company. You're gonna come in and you're gonna change everything. And, and you come in, of course, as a customer success executive and you say, no, I need some people, I need some budget, I need some systems, all that kind of stuff, right? And you ask for some budget because it's budgeting season. But you know what? In the early days, the budget hat gets passed out last to the customer success team. So you end up getting two headcount for your customer success initiative, right? <laughs> for you of you are laughing because that's real, right? And you actually, you, you have this big charter and you have this tiny resource. And what do you end up doing? What do you end up doing to a headcount? You end up being really reactive. You end up being firefighters. Some people say you're just an escalated path to get to customer support or something like that, right? And then the company starts saying, what is this customer success thing? Like, what do they actually do? Do we really need that? And honestly, the executive at that point, some of you might have been in this situation, they leave, right? They're like, this sucks. There's other better places to be. And then the company rationalizes it by saying, you know what? We didn't really need a customer success team because we're all in customer success, right? We are all in customer success. We don't need a customer success team. The sales team's going to figure that out, right? But you know what's really exciting? This is the depressing part, right? What's exciting is hundreds and hundreds of companies have come out the other side where they figure out, maybe because there's a new CEO or a private equity buyer or a hedge fund activist, whatever it is, you bring in somebody now to say, look, I need somebody senior, like Allison at our company, running the entire customer experience post-sale as chief customer officer or something like that, right? And then what's amazing is many of you then are getting revenue responsibility. Many, many people in the audience either are monetizing customer success or own renewals, or some of you are even driving expansion. And then guess what? Some of you are ending up reinventing the organization, and many of you are going to become CEOs. So this roller coaster is kind of painful, but the end is pretty awesome. And so I'm very, very excited about that. One evidence of that that I just want to share with you of crossing the chasm, it's exciting for the startups and the VCs and all that to be into customer success, 
but the private equity firms and the hedge funds and the public investors are acting, asking about customer success. There's many companies here in the audience owned by PE firms, and many PE firms make customer success one of their standard playbooks now, which is very exciting. So here's the customer success going mainstream. Awesome. Now, one of the ways in which customer success is becoming mainstream is that it's more than just the activities of the CSM team. As much as I love my CSM team, I think we're finding that customer success is really about many departments working together in service of the customer. Now, historically, the way the companies were organized was kind of in silos, and that can be good for internal accountability, but it's not always good for the client because the client can be passed from department to department. Now, we're seeing some of the most customer-centric companies actually rotating their organizational charters 90 degrees so that every department can work together all the way across the customer journey, producing better experiences and better outcomes. Now, as customer success becomes recognized as more than just a CSM team, actually it's causing an identity crisis for many CSM teams. In some cases, they're actually realizing maybe it's time that we changed our name. For example, internally at Gainsight, we call our CSMs client outcomes managers to emphasize their role in guiding our customers toward their desired outcomes. Now, if you'd like to explore this trend in more depth, we have a track at Pulse this year called Customer Success uh, Beyond CSM. Check it out. Awesome. Great. Trend number three is something actually I've been thinking about a lot, which is we call this field customer success. Customer success, right? But for the last six years in this conference and everywhere, including Gainsight, what have we been talking about? Adoption, NPS, churn rate, retention, upsell. Do your customers care about any of those things? Do they care about whether what their churn rate is with you and whether they're growing or not in spend, right? Customer success so far has been a very inside-out activity. And I'm excited with trend number three to bring customer success to be both inside-out and outside-in. Many of you in the audience are working on how do I re-engineer my thinking to not just be about our internal journey and our internal metrics, but the client's desired outcomes. Many of you are actually trying to implement some kind of success planning process where you define your goals with your client and you work through a journey with them. And it's not just about you, it's about them as well. And many of you are also re-engineering how you measure customer success. Because of course we got to measure it on retention and churn and NPS, but you also have to measure on the outcomes your clients are getting. And, and some of the most progressive amongst you are actually quantitatively measuring and reporting on those outcomes in addition to your internal metrics. Now, trend number four, as this field evolves so much, all of our teams have to evolve as well. So trend number four is what we call career success. The idea that we can't be successful as companies if our teams aren't successful as well. And I think all of us know this, like we know the research that if your employees are happy, your customers will be happy, right? What I'm super excited about is a CSM profession is a real profession. It's, you can see it here in the audience. LinkedIn does a very analytical exercise every year to look at the most promising jobs on LinkedIn. And number three this year is customer success manager. So if you want to send that to your parents and explain what you do, very, very exciting. And, and if you look at the top five fastest growing jobs on LinkedIn, one of them is customer success manager. Again, very exciting. But we've got to do our part as an industry, right? We can't just be about the customers and the metrics. We've got to be about our teams. We've got to help them get better. We've got to create career paths for them. We have to help them understand their identity. And with that, we have a whole track at Pulse called Career Success, all about individuals getting better, which is going to be very exciting. And my view for the future of this is that we're creating the next generation of leaders of companies. Because the people in customer success understand the business end to end like nobody else does. And the CCOs of today are going to be the CEOs of tomorrow, which is very exciting. Now, the fifth trend in customer success this year is being prescriptive. To illustrate what I mean, I think a lot of us have probably been in conversations with clients, me included, where that client says, I'm unique. I'm different from all of your clients. Now, we know that's true. Every company is unique. Every team is unique. But at the same time, customers do have things in common. And sometimes when they think of themselves as being more different than they actually are, they might head down the wrong path. So we're seeing some of the leading customer success teams out there becoming a lot more prescriptive in how they work with their clients. So as one example of this trend, I want to share with you how we're trying to be more prescriptive with our clients at Gainsight. 
It starts with a maturity curve for customer success. Uh, we see a lot of customer success teams trying to ascend through these four different stages. Typically, they start out in stage one, where they're reactive. They're in firefighting mode. Probably a lot of us have been in this stage. And from there, customer success teams typically try to move into an insights and action stage, where they're gathering all the data that they can on their clients, and they're taking action based on that data. But they're, they're, they're eager to move on, so they try to move on to the outcome stage, where they're trying to proactively guide customers along the customer journey through you know, outside-in customer success. Uh, and finally, they try to achieve this customer success beyond CSM stage, where uh, they're transforming their company. They're trying to get their entire company to be customer-centric. Now, the challenge for us in customer success on my team um, at Gainsight is to help our clients move through these stages of customer success. So how do we do it? What I'd love to introduce to you today Drum roll. Exciting. is Gainsight Elements. Elements are Gainsight solutions. Each element is a prescriptive approach for combining people, process, and the Gainsight platform to help our clients solve a customer success business challenge. Now, uh, much like elements from the chemistry periodic table that you might remember from your high school class, in which we talk about all the time, <laughs> Gainsight <laughs> given that we're a little bit geeky, these customer success elements live on a periodic table, and they also have abbreviations. They're mapped to the three target stages of customer success maturity that we're trying to help our, our clients get through, insights and actions, outcomes, and transformation. And, um, and you know, each element basically combines a lot of the best practices that uh, we've gathered from, from you and that we've incubated internally in customer success. I'll give you a few examples. The first element, CV, or 360-degree customer view, this is a business challenge where companies are trying to aggregate lots of data on their clients and give visibility to their entire company. Another example, renewal management, or RM. RM is about consistently executing on renewals and developing, developing informed renewal forecasts. And finally, as a third example, TT, or tech touch, uh, is, is when companies try to scale up their touch points over the customer journey using automation. Now again, uh, we've tried to assemble a lot of best practices from the community and also from our own experimentation to create these elements, but we wanted to see if there was some external data out there that suggests that actually tackling these business challenges over time indeed helps customer success organizations ascend through the maturity curve. So we surveyed about 100 customer success leaders out there across a variety of companies ranging in terms of revenue, employee size, and solution type. And you know, we asked them, for each of these business challenges or elements, does it exist at your company? And if it does, do you do it manually? Is it semi-automated? Or is it optimized? And then based on the responses, we assigned each respondent a maturity score and placed them along the maturity curve. And then we ask them, what is your gross retention rate? And what is your net retention rate? Actually, the data is pretty revealing. So what I'm showing here is the average gross retention rate for the companies that we surveyed in each of these stages. And we find, on average, companies in the transformation stage achieve 13 percentage points higher gross retention than companies in the reactive stage. And it gets even better when you look at net retention. Companies in the transformation stage experience 33 percentage points higher net retention compared to companies in the reactive stage. So it seems like there's a, va a lot of value in actually tackling these business challenges. Now, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about how we're trying to be prescriptive at Gainsight, you can check out the Science of Customer Success track today and tomorrow. You can also check out a blog post that we're releasing today. And finally, tomorrow, I'll be giving a keynote in a little bit more depth about how we're exploring elements internally at Gainsight. Awesome. And we have achieved our joint nerd geeky goal of connecting customer success to the periodic table of elements. So that's also very exciting as a childhood geek myself. So. So in the spirit, Allison, of what she said of, of being prescriptive, you know, I think all of you probably deal with this with your clients too. It's not just about your solution. It's about the ecosystem of stuff that your clients use to solve business problems. And it's not just about a, one company. And we recognize that at Gainsight. Customer success isn't just about Gainsight. There's a lot of different things involved in customer success. So we're very excited today to announce the Gainsight ecosystem, which is us trying to be more proactive and prescriptive on working with other companies out there and recommending solutions to help solve some of the business problems Allison just talked about. So we're going to launch three kind of buckets of our ecosystem to start. So number one, 
is a, a, a focus on tools related to driving adoption. Because again, Gainsight can help with adoption, but there's a lot of other things you need to do from you know, guiding your users through applications, technologies like User IQ that provide walkthroughs, or training applications to help train your users. So adoption management is one area of our ecosystem. A second is customer experience. How do you measure customer experience? You, know, you can send email surveys and things like that, but you might want to do in-app surveys with companies like Wootrick, or you may want to look at your email communications using companies companies like Comico. And then finally, advocacy is a super hot area. How do I get my customers to sell for me? And Gainsight can help with that a little bit, but how do you actually use other technologies like Influitive to complete the loop? And then of course, tying into platforms that you already use like Salesforce and other platforms out there. So the ecosystem is us, us being more prescriptive on how you can solve business problems using Gainsight and other companies. And then even more to that, 10% of the problem in customer success is technology. 90% is people and process and strategy. And so we're partnering with some of the leading services, consulting, and business management organizations out there to help you drive this transformation. Whether you're a big company or a small company, folks that can help you drive this transformation, many of them out there on the expo floor. Awesome. So to sum up, the five trends in customer success that we're hearing from you this year are crossing the chasm, customer success is more than CSM, outside in, career success, and prescriptive. And we're looking forward to exploring with you um, all these five trends over the course of the next couple days. Great, thank you so much, Allison. Big round of applause Thanks. to Allison. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So we've kind of had a little fun. We talked to you about what's coming at Pulse. We talked about the future of customer success and what we're seeing amongst you. But I want to close with one thing that's been on my mind for a while. Uh, see, last year at Pulse, if you were here, I actually had a pretty amazing moment for myself, uh, which was I tried to do something that was kind of scary, which was to talk about the, the problems I wrestle with in my life, my demons, my fears, the things that I struggle with from childhood. I, I tried to actually channel the vulnerability that some of you have probably seen in the fam famous TED Talk from Brene Brown, the idea that vulnerability is not a source of weakness, it's a source of power. And I see that for many of you in the audience. You use your vulnerability. It's not all perfect in your companies. Things go well, but things go wrong as well. So I want to talk about something a little bit vulnerable this year that I think connects to all of us, which is what are we doing with our lives? And how does that connect to the dreams we had as kids? So I want to go back to my time as a kid. That's me on the right, uh, for some reason wearing a, a suit and a, having a briefcase with probably like Legos in it or something. Eight years old there on the right. And that's my dad on the left, and that's me growing up. And my dad was actually a high-tech executive. So he actually worked at this company, Digital Equipment. Some, some of the folks my age or older know that company. And, and he was CEO of some companies. And actually, funnily enough, a little trivia, my dad would say when I was growing up, I was a little kid, he'd say, if you ever go into business, which I hope you do, make sure you're either the person building the product or you're the person selling the product because they're the only people that matter in the company, uh, which is kind of funny, obviously, given what we all talk about here, right? But that childhood experience is really important to me. In fact, I'm trying to make sure as a dad that I'm carrying the new message on to my son about the future of what business should look like, right? But the reason I bring up that childhood story is I have a very vivid memory from that same year of that photo was taken. It was a 1984. And I remember sitting in my living room and with my dad, who I'm still, my mom and dad are still so dear to me, and sitting with my dad, and he pulls out this copy of Time Magazine. Uh, Time Magazine, probably some of you don't know, it was a very popular magazine back then. And Bill Gates, uh, who was the founder and CEO of Microsoft at that time, was the youngest billionaire in the world. And you know, Microsoft is a super hot company. And my dad pulls out that magazine and says, son, maybe you could be this someday. So obviously he set the bar pretty low from the beginning. And I had that like uh, from the beginning, and probably a lot of us do, that question about like, am I going to measure up to my dad's expectations and more importantly, my own expectations, right? And fortunately, my parents are still with me and an uh, amazing part of my life. This is my amazing mom and dad there, right? And, and we, I spent a lot of time with them. Um, although probably not as much as my mom and dad would like, uh, if they're listening on the live stream. Uh, and they, and I never, I feel like I can never repay all the things that they've done for me and what I can do for them. And probably some of you feel that way about your parents as well, right? But one thing my mom does amazingly is she's super direct. She doesn't filter anything, which I love because you really know where she stands. So I took my mom and dad out. One, one time I was feeling guilty, took them out to dinner, took them out to P.F. Chang's big night out. And we went out to P.F. Chang's and said, okay, let, let's reminisce the three of us as kind of like I was kids, or like I was a kid again, right? 
And she knows that I'm super into science. That's the periodic table and all that. I love physics and quantum mechanics, all this crazy stuff. And we're talking about that. And my mom at dinner says, she says, you know, you love science so much. You love physics so much. It's too bad you didn't go into science because you could have done something important with your life. <laughs> and, and obviously she says that because she, she's totally direct, but also she knows that that's what's on my mind too. Am I doing something important with my life? Now, my dad was in business for a long time, so he actually has a little more kind of finesse around some of these things. So he's like, Mina, my mom's name's Mina. Mina, no, 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 he's just 40 years old. He can still do something, like he's still got time. <laughs> but my mom, without missing a beat, says, no, he's too old, <laughs> but maybe his kids can. Now, why do I tell you that story? I tell you that story, obviously, because it's a really funny story, and you've got to make some comedy out of your life. But more importantly, that all of us wrestle with, are we on the right track, and what's the meaning of what we're doing? And I think that's really important when you're creating a new profession, you're creating a new movement. We have to understand the why behind what we're doing, or this stuff isn't going to stick. So I want to talk to you a little bit about my journey and our journey at Gainsight to finding purpose in what we do and how it might translate to some of you as well. So for me, those moments of like, what the heck am I doing, either come with dinner with my parents or come on like a United Airlines red-eye flight to the East Coast, sitting in 9F on the window seat, trying to fall asleep in economy plus, as they say, right? <laughs> Don't know what the plus is. Um, and sitting there trying to fall asleep and wondering like, what am I doing? Like, does this all matter, right? I think all of those, uh, many of us have those moments, like what the heck am I doing with my life? Raise your hand if you want to be brave and ever have those moments about, am I doing the right thing with my life, right? You know, and it's amazing, right? All of us have that experience, right? And for me, that experience maybe is doubly so because I am a science geek and there was definitely an alternate path where I'd be in science. And my heroes aren't necessarily business leaders or you know, celebrities, they're actually great scientists. On the left, you see the late, great Stephen Hawking, may rest in peace. On the right, Vera Rubin, who actually discovered dark matter, amazing physicist from the mid-20th century. And these people, their lives was literally devoted to discovering meaning, the meaning of the universe. That's what they were working on, right? So what's the meaning of my life? What's the meaning of what we're all doing here? And, and as a CEO and as a leader, as many of you are, I'm not asking this question in the singular, why me? I'm asking it also in the plural, why us? Because I've got a company that I'm leading, right? I've got to have a meaning and a purpose behind all of this. But I look out at you and I say, why all of us? We have to have a meaning together. We've got to have a purpose in this Pulse community for what we're all doing. It can't just be about retention and churn. There's got to be something greater. And for me, that's really true. Because I, I like business, I like making money. But if it was just that, it wouldn't keep me going long term. There's got to be something else. And so we went through this journey at Gainsight of the exercise of defining purpose. Some of you have probably done this before. Purpose is a term that's pretty well defined in the business world. Jim Collins has a good definition of it. He, he wrote good to great is his definition. Purpose is a statement of why the organization exists at the most meaningful level. It's not about what you do and like what you sell. It's about why you do what you do. And the best example of purpose, in my opinion, is Walt Disney. I was at Disneyland last week, actually, and his purpose from the beginning was to make people happy. And sure, maybe he doesn't make all the parents having to go to the park happy, but he definitely makes all those little kids happy, right? And I mean, he's gone for a long time, but his company is still doing that. But when you venture into this world of purpose and meaning and values, you run into the buzzsaw of cynicism. You run into the fact that all of us have seen companies where we hire consultants and we put values on the wall and we never follow them and we define a purpose and we forget about it and our companies kind of break our hearts. Let's be honest, they kind of break our hearts. And then we put up a little wall around ourselves and we get told at work that that's okay because we need to act business-like at work. We need to be business-like. Rapping on stage, not business-like, right? We need to have more gravitas. That's actually something uh, one of my 360 reviews from a board member a long time ago said, Nick, you're great. Could you have a little more gravitas? I was like, I don't think that's a word, gravitas, but still, I, I'm not gonna do it, right? They, they tell us we should leave our emotions at the door. We shouldn't be emotional at work. They tell us that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog uh, world out there. You're either going to be the dog eating or the dog being eaten. And they tell us, but don't worry, our employees are our greatest assets. That's what we are, right? All of us are assets. That's what we get told at work. So purpose doesn't matter. Meaning doesn't matter. It's just business. And that, it goes back to that line from Godfather, 
It's not personal, it's just business. That's what Michael Corleone said. That's how a lot of our companies are run. But for me, honestly, I just couldn't do it. It would just be way too boring and empty to just focus on business. I actually wrote about this a few years ago on, on my blog about how it's just tough to find meaning, particularly in things like enterprise software, which many of you are in, where it's really great stuff and we solve business problems, but we're not exactly flying a car into space or like curing cancer. Maybe some of you are, but not all of us are, right? So how do you find meaning at work? And for me, I'm a father of three ch young children with my wife. And you know, for me, I get asked that question every day because my kids every day, this is my kids, by the way, the cutest kids in the world, uh, uh, as my wife and I both agree. And they, the 12, nine and five year olds, they ask me all the time, daddy, what do you actually do? I know you like sing on stage and you send emails and you have meetings, but what do you actually do and how does it relate to making Minecraft better, right? <laughs> Because that's the only context they have for software at all. So with all that set up, we went through this journey. And at Gainsight, we said, look, we might have a different way to define our purpose. It might not be about what we do, but we can talk about why we do what we do as our purpose. Some of you probably know the Start With Why talk from Ted, Simon Sinek. It's a very famous TED talk about the idea that some of the best companies don't focus on what they do, they focus on why they do what they do. And at Gainsight, we've always been very oriented around not just what we do, but how and why we do it. These are our values at Gainsight. Some of you know them. We're very, very passionate about them. So going through all that, we went through this process and said, why are we doing what we do? And maybe we can't change the entire world with customer success software, but maybe we can change the world around us. Because right around us, in our little company, we've got lots of teammates, we've got their families, we've got the customers, not just as entities, but as human beings. We've got our partners, we've got our investors, we've got our community. We have a lot of people that we can help. And can we help them not just as organizations, but as human beings? So at Gainsight, we, with that big setup, we said, why do we come to work? And we came out with our purpose, which I'm actually proud to release to you guys today, which is our purpose at Gainsight is to be living proof that you can win in business by being human first. That you don't have to leave your humanity at the door at work. That you can be a human being, you can be cheesy, you can be silly, you can be childlike, and you can still be successful. And we say living proof because we don't want to be the only ones to do this, we want everyone to do this. And we want human first to mean lots of things, like for example, really embracing flexibility. So your company allows people to live their entire life, whether it's spending time with children, or parents, or friends, or being at work. We think human first means being super transparent with your employees and your customers and all the people around you, including showing them what's happening in your board meetings, and all the good, the bad, the ugly. We think human first means treating every employee in your company like they're the most important person in your company. Whether they're the newest person or the CEO, everyone's the most important person. Human first means when somebody leaves your company, you don't treat them like a traitor. I have a lot of Gainsight alumni in the audience. I love you guys. You guys are amazing. You did so much for Gainsight and you're spreading the word to all kinds of other companies, so thank you. It means when people leave, you treat them just as well as when they came in the door. And by the way, human first even means when you have competition, you don't vilify them and demon, demonize them. They're just human beings like you trying to do a good job, right? I even love my competition, right? I, these are all human beings here. And so for us at Gainsight, fundamentally, it's flipping Michael Corleone around and saying that it's not business, it's personal. And I think that's something to get excited about. Very, very exciting. And I also think it's something that's important in this era. It's very important because we're looking as humans staring down the barrel of some scary stuff. Artificial intelligence, robots, you know, machine learning. I, I saw Ready Player One a few weeks ago. It doesn't end well, right, for all of us, right? Some of you guys have seen it already. And w humans are needed more than more in our business world because it feels like the humanity is being sucked out of business. Now, how does this tie to what all of you do? Well, I think customer success fundamentally ties to this well. Because the old model was all about a zero-sum game. It was about I win, you lose. I sell you and move on. I'm going to go hunt and kind of scorch the earth, right? That's what it was like. We're going to hunt everywhere. We eventually run out of places to hunt, but hopefully we sold the company by then. That's like the old model, right? The new model is fundamentally a sustainable model where we're working with our customers as human beings, us and our customers, to solve problems together. We're sustainably farming the land so it can grow for hundreds and hundreds of years to come. I believe customer success 
is fundamentally a human endeavor. And I think all the humans in this room and all the humanity here kind of proves that. So here's to bringing humanity back into customer success and back into our companies. Awesome. So whether you buy into that purpose or any other, I encourage you to think about purpose as you're here at Pulse. Because if you're leaders or if you're a team member, you can't do your job without purpose. I'm very excited that many people are going to be talking about purpose throughout the conference. Wendy Sturgis, dear friend of Gainsight, chief customer officer of Yex that just went public, is going to do an amazing talk about her company's purpose, her team's purpose, and her personal purpose, and what kind of gets her excited as well. I encourage all of you to listen to it. It's one of the keynotes that you'll see on the stage here. So just to close it out and close out this keynote, if you're like me and you have those WTF moments where you're wondering what the heck is the meaning of it all and you're wondering why am I doing what I'm doing, I encourage you to lean into that anxiety. Lean into the fear. Ask those hard questions. What's the purpose of my company? What's the purpose of my team? Let me define a purpose for my team. And what's my personal why? Why am I actually here? What gets me excited about what I'm doing? And if you ask all those questions and you're still confused, like I am most of the time, I encourage you to go and do what I did and send a word to your mother. Thank you very much, everyone. Here's to a great Pulse 2018. Thank you.